Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first virtual tour of the Ancient Egyptian Art Collection at the Met. We're happy that uh, tonight's event is a co-sponsored event between the Jewish Center and uh, Rabbi Shlosh Shul, uh, Shul Aderet El. So we're happy to, uh, to bring together two uh, great synagogues um, in Manhattan. The entire holiday of Pesach and Seder is all about Yitziat Mitzrayim. The times that we eat reflect the time that a plague happened at Chatzot Halayla. We talk about Machlokatim in the Gemara, about what time we left Egypt. Everything about Seder night is about Yitziat Mitzrayim, that we were slaves and now we're free. Tonight, we have the opportunity to jump a little bit back into what it meant to live in ancient Egypt, the culture, the history, and we're so glad that we have Alana Kaplan here to be our guide. Alana Kaplan is a museum educator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art at the Denver Judaic and at the, De and at the Denver Judaic Museum. She also created and leads an integrated learning, uh, learning uh, and museum tour program for both adults and school groups. Alana presents virtual museum tours for groups around the globe. She received her BA in history from Barnard College and a double master's degree from NYU in Jewish history and museum studies. She lives in Teaneck, New Jersey with her husband and they are the proud parents of four children. We are so happy to have her join us this evening to give us a tour of the Met. I'll turn it now over to Alana Kaplan. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rabbi Buchler. Thank you to the Jewish Center and to Congregation Adarat El for um, hosting my program tonight. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I just want to explain what, can, what we'll be doing tonight so everyone has an idea of the program. So uh, my program lasts about uh, a little less than an hour, and it'll be a mix of a virtual tour of the ancient Egyptian galleries at the Met, enhanced with um, images of artifacts and um, sources from Tanakh, um, and some personal pictures also. And um, so that'll be about a little less than an hour. And, and then at the end, I'm happy to take questions from the chat if anyone wants to unmute and ask any questions. Um, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions or comments at the end. So just to start off, we say at the, we say every year at the Seder, Behold Dorva Dor Chayav Adam Lirot et Atzmo Ki Ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim. So I'm hoping tonight that through seeing these artifacts from ancient Egypt, that it'll better help us prepare and visualize um, as if we ourselves came out of Mitzrayim. Okay, so we are going to go now to the museum. So I'm gonna share my screen with everybody. Okay. Oops. Okay, so we are all together now in front of the uh, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I'm sure many of you, if not all of you have been here before, spent time on these stairs. So I just wanna do a little bit of a background on the Met's ancient Egyptian collection before we start looking at it. So the Met has over 30,000 objects from ancient Egypt, um, which is a very large uh, collection. Um, now other museums around the world, also the, the British Museum has 80,000 objects. Museums in Egypt, of course, have many, many objects. So uh, there, um, many, many objects from ancient Egypt because of course people were buried um, in tombs and pyramids with objects that they wanted. They had a strong belief in the afterlife and they believed that they would come back to life and they wanted to have their objects with them. So that's how we have, uh, that's why there were so many objects buried in ancient Egypt. How does the Met have so many objects? So that goes back to the early 1900s. Um, in the early 1900s, the Egyptian government invited archeologists from museums and institutions around the world to come to Egypt and do archeological digs with the permission of the Egyptian government. And they set up a system called partage. And partage is a French word, it means to share. So basically, the Egyptian government uh, allowed all these archaeologists to come and dig and take half of what they found back to their institutions. So there are many ways to look at this, and there are you know, many discussions to be had about this. Some people see this as a very fair system. Um, some people see it as colonialism. Um, this doesn't happen anymore. It happened in the early 1900s. Uh, we still do send archaeologists to uh, Egypt today. Um, there are currently um, many archaeological digs going on, but those are just for educational purposes. We, we don't take any um, artifacts out of Egypt anymore. But in the early 1900s, that was a system that was set up, and it was believed to be beneficial for everyone. It was beneficial for Egypt because they had archaeologists from around the world, um, do, you know, helping them find um, all uh, many artifacts and helping them locate them and 
um, and um, uh, treat them. But it was certainly um, beneficial for museums around the world and archaeologists around the world because they were able to take um, objects with permission back to their museums. And it was a way for them to teach uh, their audiences and all of us around the world about ancient Egypt. Um, so that's how the Met really got the bulk of their collection. Um, as I said, we have over 30,000 objects spanning from anywhere from over 5,000 years ago until about uh, 2,000 years ago. Okay, so with that introduction, we're going to look at our first picture. This picture was taken in 1920 on one of those archaeological digs I was just talking about. And the Met archaeologists were on a dig and they had an amazing discovery. They found a tomb uh, of a man named Mecca Ray. So Mecca Ray was not a pharaoh, but he was an ancient, he was an important official in ancient Egypt. He lived, uh, he, he died and was buried in the 1980s BCE. So we're talking almost 4,000 years before this archeological dig. And um, when he was buried, um, he was buried with many objects we're gonna look at. Now, uh, many pharaohs and important officials were buried in ancient Egypt with uh, lots of um, treasures, right? They were buried with furniture, with gold, with silver, with um, all kinds of important objects, with models, with paintings. Um, of course, because they believed they needed these things in the afterlife. But everybody knew that they were buried with these objects. So oftentimes, after people were buried, grave robbers came and invaded graves. So that did happen to Mecca Ray. But for some reason, they missed two rooms in his tomb. We're not sure why, but he missed these two rooms. Uh, they missed these two rooms and they stayed sealed until the Met's archaeologists came in 1920 and found these two rooms. So it was a huge discovery. Um, and I'm going to show you the picture of what they saw when they first entered this room. So this is what it looked like, one of the rooms in the tomb when they first entered. And if you take a couple of seconds to look at this picture, um, of course, black and white, because uh, this was 1920. Um, but if you take a few seconds, you can probably recognize a couple of things in this room. Um, and Mecca Ray was actually buried with 24 models, 24 models of things that he owned in his life that he wanted to have in the afterlife. Um, they were too big for him to be buried with, so he had um, wooden models made of these objects. So as you're looking at this room and orienting yourself, you might see a couple of boats, models of boats, you might see some models of uh, wooden models of people. You might see some animals. Um, now, I did say no one had been in this tomb since Mecca Ray was buried in uh, 1986 BCE. But of course, because of earth movements and earthquakes, things did get a little bit jumbled together. So it looks like some of the pieces of the tomb uh, you know, fell. But, um, but they still were in excellent condition because they were in an airtight tomb in the dry climate in Egypt. So I'm gonna now take you into the museum so we can see what these models look like um, in the museum. Okay, so we are going together into the room with the Mecca Ray models. So some of you might have been in this room. This is actually one of my favorite rooms in the museum. These models are unbelievably detailed and they're going to connect us to life in ancient Egypt and connect us to different parts of the Seder. So just uh, getting a look at this room, you'll see along the wall here are six models of boats. Um, and then in these, this glass case over here are five models of Mecca Ray's estate. Now, I know we can't see them so clearly, and um, that's actually not my computer or your computer. That is the virtual technology that the um, uh, Met did a Google Street View in 2010, which then was the forefront of technology, but today is a little bit outdated. So it's not so clear, but I'm going to show you the images clearer in a couple of minutes. I really just wanted to give you a feel for this room for anyone who hasn't been in here. Um, so you can see these models of boats. You can see the importance, what Mecca Ray found so important to have buried in his tomb. So we see the boats um, and we see also the model of his estate. So now you see on the wall, the ancient models from the tomb of Mecca Ray and all this writing on the wall is exactly what I'm telling you. You see the big picture, the picture we were just looking at blown up on the wall here. And you get a feeling hopefully uh, for the size of these models. Um, again, they're all made out of wood and um, the importance of boats. Mecca Ray was buried, remember we only have half of them. So he was buried with 24 uh, models, 12 boat models and 12 estate models, and we have half. Now, why, why were boats so important to Mecca Ray? As I said, he was an important official in ancient Egypt. He, he used his boats for travel and for trade. And he also, they also believed that they would get to the afterlife on a boat. So he needed a boat to travel to the afterlife. 
So uh, boats were very, very important in ancient Egypt. We have models of boats and paintings of boats, not just from Meket Ray, um, but from many other people. Okay, so now we got an idea of the size of them. Maybe you notice some of the details of them, lots of people, lots of slaves on these boats. But I wanna go back and um, back to my images so we can see the, um, we can see these pictures a lot clearer and in color. Okay, so here's one of the boats that we were just looking at, but um, now we can really see it in detail. So if you look at the boat, you'll notice lots of details. First of all, Meket Ray is the one always sitting on the boat, not working. Everybody else is working, he's sitting, uh, relaxing. You'll notice a lot of slaves on these boats. Okay, Meket Ray had a lot of slaves, and you'll also notice that in general, there were a lot of uh, slaves in his models. That tells us that there were a lot of, there was a large class of slaves in ancient Egypt. Now, um, these were not uh, Israelite slaves because these boats were uh, made around 1986 BCE. So that is depending on how we date the um, Israelite uh, time in ancient Egypt. Um, but this was definitely a couple hundred years before that, maybe around two to 300 years before the Israelites were in Egypt. But again, it shows us there were a lot of slaves in ancient Egypt and what kind of jobs that they, they did. Um, it also shows us what they wore. These are all the clothing is made out of linen. And it shows us how boats were made and what and boats were so important. We see how they would um, have the steering oar for the boat. This guy in front of the boat, he's holding something in his hand. That's actually used to measure the Nile River. We know that sometimes the Nile River overflows. Sometimes it's very low. Um, in ancient Egypt, they believed all of that was controlled by their gods. They believed really that their gods controlled everything. Um, and uh, if the gods were angry at them, there wasn't enough water. Um, so if there wasn't enough water, the boat couldn't get through. So of course they had to measure the Nile River every time they traveled. So why am I showing you all the details of these boats? And I'm gonna show you some more because um, this really connects us to the importance of the Nile River in ancient Egypt. So the Nile River what is the longest river in the world. It runs uh, between uh, 10 to 11 countries. Um, and it was very, very important in ancient Egypt for trade and for travel. So if we think about the first plague, right? The first plague was um, our own turning the Nile River to blood. So when we usually think about it, we, we think about it, okay, it was devastating because the water, the Egyptians drinking water was blood, their bathing water, the water that they used to water their plants or agricultural water was all blood. But now if you look at these boats and realize how important the Nile River was for trade, for travel, for the economy of Egypt, for it taking over other countries. So when they saw the Nile River turn to blood, they must have really panicked because that would have totally affected their trade and their travel. They didn't know how long it was gonna last for. It would have been a very, very devastating plague. And these boats and all the boats that we have in our paintings in the museum and all the models we have really show the importance of the Nile River. Um, so, so these are really a visualization of how important the Nile River was for trade, for travel, for the, for the whole economy of ancient Egypt. And of course, that's also how they believe they would get to the afterlife. So let's look at a couple more of these boats, again, to, to emphasize the importance of the Nile River. So here we have Meket Ray. Uh, he's sitting over here, again, not working. Everybody else has a job. And this is his fishing and fouling boat. So again, they would fish and foul in the Nile River. Again, when it turned to blood, how you know devastating that would be, no fishing or fouling, what would happen to all the fish in the Nile River. Um, uh, and again, shows us how the importance of the Nile River. Um, and our last boat that we're gonna look at is actually a boat. This is the boat that Mecca Ray would travel to the afterlife. And we know that because here we have Mecca Ray sitting on his stool, again, not working. He's hold, holding a lotus flower to his lips. And that is a symbol of the afterlife. So the Nile River was so important to the Egyptians. It was also their way to get to their, uh, to the next life. Um, so again, the, the first plague would have been so devastating to them um, when it was turned to blood. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. And we saw in that room also, I showed you glass cases of uh, models of Mecca Ray's estate. So now we're gonna look at these in detail and they are really gonna bring um, ancient Egyptian life. Um, really, uh, they're gonna um, show us really what it, what it was like through these models. So as I'm talking, you might've figured out what this is a model of. And I'm actually gonna go just to a different, another view of the same model. So you can have a bird's eye view. So you might've noticed what's going on here. This is actually Meket Ray's slaughterhouse. Okay, we can see the cows on the ground. Um, we can see um, how they slaughtered cows. They hung up the meat to dry up here. They would collect the blood um, over here. Um, this also shows us again 
um, the slaves. And it shows us the visualization of a taskmaster, right? We will look at a source in a little bit that talks about a taskmaster. Um, so here we have slaves that are working and then taskmasters that are in charge of them, right? With a spear on their shoulder to make sure that they are working. This also shows us, by the way, that they ate meat in ancient Egypt. A lot of people always say to me, oh, they didn't eat meat in ancient Egypt because they worshiped animals but they did eat meat in ancient Egypt. Um, meat was expensive, so it wasn't eaten by everyone. It was eaten by the upper classes, which Mecca Ray was part of. But we see from this visualization that Mecca Ray had a slaughterhouse. Uh, they would have been eating meat. Um, we're also gonna look at a source that tells us that there was meat, that meat was eaten in ancient Egypt. So here we have our first source um, from Tanakh, from Shmo. And, um, we have here Vayomru Aleam Bene Israel, Mi Tain Mutenu Biyad Hashem Be Eretz Mitraim, Bishivtenu Al Sir Habasar, Bachlenu Lechem. So the Israelites said to them, This is when they were in the desert and they were um, complaining that there wasn't enough food. If only we had died by the hands of the Lord in the lands of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, when we ate, ate our fill of bread. Okay, so flesh pots uh, in Hebrew it says Al Sir Habasar. So Basar is meat. They clearly, there was meat being eaten in Egypt. I'm not sure that the Israelites were eating it because it was very expensive and I don't think slaves were eating meat, but they knew that meat was being eaten. But the other food that they're talking about, which is also very important, is lechem, right? Bread. So bread was a very important food in ancient Egypt, and we're going we're gonna to develop that idea in depth. Um, but the point is that the Israelites are remembering meat which was a, a, a rich man's food and bread. Now bread actually in ancient Egypt, they used bread to pay the slaves. So that was, that's how they paid slaves. So it was um, al almost seen as like um, uh, a food of slaves because that's what they used to uh, pay them. And actually um, a, a couple of interesting facts about bread. There's a very interesting book that was written called 6,000 Years of Bread. And in that book, the author um, says that uh, um, ancient Egypt was one of the first societies to, they were actually one of the first societies to make bread. Uh, I think in the book it says they were the first ones to make actual bread because they were um, one of the earliest permanent societies. Before them, most ancient civilizations, many of them were nomadic because they had to travel where there was water. But because the Egyptians were settled around the Nile River, they had a, they could settle permanently. They didn't have to worry about um, you know, traveling around in search of water all the time. So because of that, they could settle, they could make bread. Bread was a food of, of permanence, of settlement. It took time to make bread, um, to grind the grain, to add water, for it to rise, to form the dough and to, you know, bread, loaves of bread and heat it. All these kind of things took a lot of time. So it was a food of a settled society. And of course, we are all probably thinking that we're going to, we're, uh, comparing that with right matzah, right, which is really seen as a more a food of nomadic tribes. Matzah and pita were for tribes for, for people who moved around. Okay, so um, and we of course can and tie that into um, the Pesach seder. Okay, so let's look at this uh, idea in a visualization. So here's our next Mechet Ray model, and this is probably my favorite model in the whole museum. It's amazingly detailed, and I think it really so ties us to the, the story of the Israelites in Egypt in many ways. So as I'm talking, maybe some of you figured out what's going on in this model. This is a model of Mechet Ray's granary. Um, so grain was very, very important in ancient Egypt, so much so that Mechet Ray had his own granary. Um, and we'll see what's happening here, very detailed. We have these two men um, by the door, they're recording how much grain comes in and how much grain goes out. You can see the people coming in from the fields, the slaves coming in from the fields with their, their baskets and their, um, their bags of grain that they bring through the door um, after it's been um, counted or weighed. Um, they bring it up the stairs and then they pour the grain in these um, pits over here. Now, grain was so important in ancient Egypt and, and uh, I'm sure you're all thinking about what grain was used for in ancient Egypt, but it was so important. It wasn't just used to make food, it was also a commodity. And if we think about when Yosef's brothers came down to Mitzrayim because there was a famine in Canaan, we know that they brought money and they needed to buy grain. And you know, money isn't really worth anything if there's no food to buy. So it was really seen as a commodity in ancient Egypt. And it was so important that actually Mecca 
second ray in his tomb was buried with actual grain. We know that because when the archaeologists went into the tomb for the first time, they found little rat droppings in this uh, in these pits over here, and they realized that even though no humans had been in the tomb since Mecca Ray was buried almost 4,000 years earlier, there were rats that got in and they ate most of the grain out of out of the granary. So that shows us grain was so important that Mecca Ray wanted actual grain, not models of grain, he wanted actual grain with him in the afterlife. Now, we also know that grain, we are, uh, the Israelites are very much connected to grain because Yosef, when he became Paro's second in command, he was in charge of the greenery for, for ancient Egypt. So now, based on this small model of Mecca Ray's uh, estate, we can imagine the granary in ancient Egypt that Yosef was in charge of. And the idea of recording how much grain there is in case, you know, there was a famine, right? You had to save up and you had to keep records of it and, and uh, make sure there was enough stored. And this is an amazing visualization of what the granary that Yosef was in charge of, what it must have looked like. Um, so now let's see, what did they use grain for in ancient Egypt? Why was it so important? So here we have our next Mecca Ray model, which tells us what they used, what they made that grain out of. On the right side, you might have figured out what they're making out of that grain. There, that's the bakery. They're making bread out of the grain. And again, we tie that into the importance of bread in ancient Egypt. Um, they were uh, as a settled permanent society. Bread was a symbol of their settlement. They used it to pay their slaves. It was a symbol of their um, you know, conquering other cultures and their way to keep people under control. They paid them in bread. Um, on the left side is a drink that they used to make in ancient Egypt out of grain. So they would put grain in these uh, small jugs that you see here. They would add water from the Nile River. And you might've figured out that that drink that they were making was beer. Now, beer was not an alcoholic drink in ancient Egypt. It was a regular drink. Um, perhaps they added grain and to make the Nile River taste uh, better, the Nile River water, maybe that's why they drink beer. But anyway, it was a regular drink. And again, it shows uh, the importance of of grain. So now I just wanted to show you, this is the same model, just again, a bird's eye view. So you can really, it's really showing us the process of taking grain and making it into bread, that they would grind the grain, uh, they would add water to it, um, they would make it into loaves, they would bake it. It was a whole process that they're showing us in these models. Now, as we're looking at these models, there are many things to keep in mind besides the importance of brain, grain and bread. Um, in terms of artistic, um, uh, ability, just um, thinking that these models were all made, they're the originals, they were made 4,000 years ago. So just keeping in mind as we're looking at all these objects today, that they were made 4,000 years ago before they had any kind of advanced tools. They're using very, very basic tools. Um, they didn't go to art school or have art lessons. So it's, it's pretty amazing all the art that they were making and all these objects they were creating for tombs uh, 4,000 years ago, and even more than 4,000 years ago. Okay, so let's look at the importance of bread and grain from our, uh, from, from Tanakh. So our first source, uh, both sources are from Brishi, but our first source is um, the story of Paro. Um, when Paro got angry, um, so Paro was angry with his two courtiers, right? The chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So of course, if, if bread was such an important food in ancient Egypt, uh, for all the reasons we've talking about, of course, Paro would have a chief baker. Um, and that was a very important rule, role. The chief cupbearer was in charge of the wine, which was also important. Um, but bread was really the symbol of, of food, of their advanced society, of their settled society, um, and on, of the way they, they controlled um, their slaves. Our second source from Breshit is talking about Yosef, which I referred to earlier. Um, okay, so, and he, this is talking about Yosef, he gathered all the grain of the seven years that the land of Egypt was enjoying and stored the grain in the cities and he put in each city the grain of the fields around it. So it talks about grain three times, very important. This is an important job that Yosef had, the importance of grain. And what I find even more interesting is that the Hebrew word is ochel. In English, they're translating it as grain, but in Hebrew it's ochel, which is food, right? So they're referring to, to, to them, 
grain equals food. To me, when I say food, I think of all, all kinds of foods that I like to eat. I wouldn't think of grain, but in ancient Egypt, grain was food. It was so important. And uh, we saw that and we uh, were able to visualize that. And of course, that connects us to the story of Pesach, to the matzah, right? And we, uh, you know, the matzah didn't have time to rise. The Jews were, uh, the Israelites were taking it um, on their way out of Mitzrayim. And again, comparing the, the bread as a food that was given to slaves um, with matzah. So then matzah, really, we see it as a, the, the a food, the bread of freedom, right? It was the bread of freedom. They weren't going to take uh, bread anymore, which was what slaves were paid for, but they were going to have matzah. And that was their bread of freedom and also showed it's a nomadic food. They were leaving. They were on their way out. Um, and it really um, shows how important grain and bread were. Okay, so our last model we're gonna look at from Mecca Reza State estate is his garden. Again, all these models are made out of painted wood. So now we're just gonna take a look back at that picture we were looking at from 1920, the first picture of the archeologists, what they came upon when they um, went into Mecca Ray's tomb. And now you all will um, recognize a lot of these models. Here's our model of the garden, uh, some of the boats, uh, a couple of the uh, models of Mecca Reza State. Now you might be noticing that we didn't see all these models, um, but remember we only have half of them, the other half are in Egypt. Um, I think for our purposes, we have the best models because it's the, the food making models, which really again connect um, uh, the story of the Israelites in ancient Egypt, um, but they really are again, unbelievable models. Okay, so now we're going to go on to our next topic. We're gonna leave the models, which is small scale. And now we're gonna look at some very large sculptures and go on the big scale. Okay, so. Our next discussion is going to be about who was the Pharaoh of the oppression, who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, this could be a whole hour or longer talk in itself um, for many reasons. It's very hard to give an exact uh, answer to who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus because there are many ways to date it. And also as we're talking about this subject, we have to keep in mind that um, we're getting our resources, um, first of all, from Tanakh and we do have some, um, uh, years and times in Tanakh. But of course, we know that the Torah is not meant to be a history book. It's not meant to be a book of chronology. So we also get dates and, and timing from, from Egyptian sources. And we do have a lot of Egyptian sources. Um, however, we have to keep in mind one thing about Egyptian sources. Unlike other ancient cultures, um, like ancient Mesopotamia and ancient uh, Greece and Rome that kept sources for historical pur pur uh, purposes. In ancient Egypt, they were not interested in recording history at all. The only reason they kept so many records was to glorify the gods and goddesses and the pharaohs. That was the only reason. So I kind of look at it as uh, the records were really propaganda. Anything that didn't glorify the gods or goddesses or the pharaohs was not included in the historical records and uh, it was not included in, uh, they didn't have objects made for those things either. And I will show you examples of that. Um, and it's important to keep in mind. So when we're dating the Exodus, uh, you, you can read lots of different articles. Uh, there are many um, Israeli scholars and archeologists and biblical scholars who have different dates for this. I'm going to propose two based on on different sources, um, but there are, there are more than that. Okay, so with that backdrop, we are here looking at a sphinx of a pharaoh. Um, as you're looking at this, by the way, as you looked at the models and as you're looking at these sculptures, you will notice that there are no personal, personalized features on any of them. So it's hard, you can't look at them and tell which pharaoh they are. Um, we do that by finding the hieroglyphics. If you look at this, you might find some hieroglyphics. Um, we have other ways to date sculptures also, carbon dating and x-rays, but the hieroglyphics are our best uh, answer to know who the sculptures are. This is actually a sphinx of a female pharaoh whose name is Hatshepsut. Now, any of you who have kids in sixth grade or grandkids and ask them, they will be familiar with this female pharaoh Hatshepsut. And we're gonna spend a little time on her today because I'm going to propose that she was uh, the last Pharaoh of the oppression, the last Pharaoh of the Jews being slaves. Now, the, the, the I say Jews, but it's Israelites because they weren't called Jews yet. The Israelites were slaves from anywhere from 86 to 116 years in Egypt. So there were many, there were a number of Pharaohs when they were slaves, but uh, she was, I'm proposing based on dates that she was the last 
pharaoh of oppression. So let's look at a source for uh, how I'm, I'm dating that. So the source we're looking at here is Malachim Aleph. Um, and you'll see that it says, Vayihi, Okay, so in the 480th year, after the Israelites left the lands of Egypt in the month of Ziv, that is the second month, in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. So according to this source in Malachim Aleph, this tells us that 480 years after um, the Jews left, the, the Israelites left Egypt, um, uh, Shlomo began to build a Beit HaMikdash. So um, most people agree that the Beit HaMikdash was built around the year 966 BCE. And remember, it's all around because of the difficulty in dating that I pointed out before. So if you add 480 years to that date, then you will get uh, around the year 1446 BCE. And that is actually right after uh, Hatshepsut was the, the, the pharaoh. Okay, so that would put Hatshepsut as uh, the last pharaoh of the oppression. Now, she's a very interesting uh, pharaoh, and we're going to actually go into the museum to the Hatshepsut room to talk about her a little bit more. Um, but I want to talk about her while everyone's looking at sculptures. So here we're back in the Metropolitan Museum of Art together. We're in a room full of Hatshepsut sculptures. And as I'm showing you some of the sculptures, um, I want everyone to just notice different things about these sculptures. And hopefully the things that you're thinking and noticing, I will point out. So first of all, you might notice that um, if I didn't tell you it was a female pharaoh, it would be very hard to see that because she's portrayed as a male pharaoh. She's wearing the, um, the headdress of a pharaoh, which female pharaohs would have also worn, but she's wearing the false beard of a pharaoh, which only male pharaohs wore. Um, and there's no way to indicate on these sculptures that she's a female. By the way, she's kneeling here. She's giving offerings to the gods and goddesses, again, showing the importance of gods and goddesses in ancient Egypt. Um, and we will talk about that uh, more. So, uh, so you'll also notice these are huge sculptures. I, I wish there were people in this room so you can get an idea, but I'll show you pictures. Um, but when I stand next to these sculptures, I probably reach about Hatshepsut's elbows. So these are huge sculptures carved out of stone. Again, remember these are carved 4,000 years ago before they had, you know, lasers or before they had cranes or, or machinery or anything. So it's pretty amazing how they were made. They're huge sculptures ca carved out of stone. And imagine being in Egypt, right? We're supposed to see ourselves as, as if we came out of Mitzrayim. Imagine we are in Egypt and you're working as a slave and you see these huge lifelike larger than life sculptures of the pharaohs, how, how scary that is. It's kind of like someone's always watching you, right? Big Brother's always watching you to make sure you're working. And by the way, we have a room full of Hatshepsut sculptures. Some are just heads, some are sculptures, but that's just the Met. I mean, there were, there were hundreds of these sculptures created of Hatshepsut. Now, you might also notice that some of them look broken. Okay, now a sculpture made out of solid stone, even if it's 4,000 years old, will not just break unless it is permanent, it's, it's purposely broken uh, by someone. So that leads us into the story of Hatshepsut. She was, uh, as I said, she was a female pharaoh, but she was not supposed to be pharaoh. Her father was a pharaoh. Her father was Tutmosis the um, first. Then she actually married her half brother, um, who was Tutmosis the second, and they were married. And then her, her husband, who was her half brother also died. And he had a son that was her stepson, Tutmosis III. Now, when her husband died, her stepson was very young. So, so Hatshepsut said, you know what? I'm going to rule instead of my stepson, Tutmosis III, because he's too young. So I'm going to make myself pharaoh. So that answers a couple of our questions now. Why does she look like a male in most of her sculptures? Because she wanted to be taken seriously. Uh, she wasn't supposed to be pharaoh. And uh, male pharaohs were taken much more seriously. So most of her sculptures, she is shown as a male. Okay, here's another one of her standing. She's mostly shown as a male with a false beard. Um, now, what happened to her sculptures? Well, Tutmosis III was very angry as he got older and he found out his stepmother took over uh, ruling from him. So when she died um, around 1458 BCE and he became king, he had all of her sculptures destroyed, like, like smashed to smithereens, small pieces. And he had her name erased from the list of pharaohs. So actually from 14... 59 BCE 
till 1822 CE, nobody knew of Hatshepsut. She was wiped from history. Remember I said that the uh, Egyptians only recorded things they wanted to be recorded. Tutmosis III wanted her, her memory erased and it, he almost succeeded until the 1820s when there were archeologists that started digging and they started finding pieces of sculpture and they started putting things together and they realized based on some of these sculptures and hieroglyphics that there was this female Pharaoh Hatshepsut. By the way, when she was Pharaoh, she was very powerful. She was not the head of the army like most pharaohs were because only male pharaohs could be the head of the army, but she increased uh, trade by, tremendously for ancient Egypt. So she really helped the economy tremendously. Anyway, uh, she was a uh, uh, very, very powerful pharaoh. And by the way, if you look at her, you might notice that um, her face a lot of the sculptures, her face is missing or her face is wiped out. And that is because, um, or her face is broken. That's because they believe first, uh, if you destroyed someone's face, you destroyed them, you destroyed their memory, you destroyed everything about them. So that's the first thing would destroy the face and then they would go in to destroy the body. Now you might've noticed I wasn't showing you the other side of the room. And that's because we do have some sculptures where Hatshepsut is portrayed as feminine, where she's not wearing the false beard uh, and she's wearing a dress and she looks more feminine in these sculptures in the end. Um, so we, we know she was a female. We do have sculptures of her uh, as a female, but the majority of them, she looks like a strong ruling uh, male Pharaoh. By the way, notice that we are missing uh, the face on a lot of them, the parts of the body still missing. That's by the way, that, why they still have archeological digs going on because there's so much. Uh, they say we still don't have 90% uh, of what was actually buried in ancient Egypt. Um, okay, so that is, our story of Hatshepsut. Now let's try and, uh, we're gonna look at a couple more pictures and then I'm gonna tie her more in uh, to the idea of her being the last Pharaoh of oppression through our sources. So let's go back and look at a couple more pictures of Hatshepsut um, or sculptures of her. Um, this is me in the museum next to Hatshepsut, just to give you an idea of the size of Hatshepsut. By the way, the, the Met is open and for people who are comfortable visiting, it is open. Um, I, uh, I've been there a couple of times and I, I plan to, I'm actually doing tours of the Egyptian collection over, um, over Cholomoed. Um, I often bring my kids to the museum. This is already two years ago, but I just wanted to give you an idea, whoops, of the size of these sculptures. So this was two years ago. My daughter was uh, maybe a little bit shorter, but you can see she, how small she looks compared to these sculptures. And imagine, I always say to my kids and even to myself, imagine you know, being a, a slave in Egypt next to these huge sculptures, what it must have felt like how you must have felt, you know, who is controlling you and how important it was for Moshe to get the Israelites out. Um, also, we're gonna see there were huge sculptures of gods and goddesses also. So it really was not a good place for them to be. Um, and also how threatening the Israelites were to the Egyptians because they believed in one God, uh, which monotheism was, uh, was unheard of then. The Egyptians believed that they had multiple gods controlling every aspect of their life. So to have this people who didn't believe in their gods, who believed in one God, who you know wanted to leave and worship, it was so threatening to them. Um, okay, so here's another sculpture of Hatshepsut. Again, we saw this one in the room. Notice the nose is broken. First break the face, erase the memory, and then break the entire sculpture. And then finally, a sculpture of Hatshepsut as a female. We can see again the hieroglyphics telling us who it is, but here she, she looks uh, more feminine. She's wearing a dress, she has a necklace on. Um, so we do have some images of her as a feminine, as a female. Okay, so let's look at a couple of our sources that we're familiar with, sources from our Haggadah, right? So, um, so a long time after that, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cried out, and their cry for help from the bondage grows, rose up to God. So this source just tells us that there was, uh, there was the last king or pharaoh of the oppression, and that pharaoh died, and then another pharaoh came to power. So I'm one of the things that I'm proposing based on, on reading and, and sources um, is that that Pharaoh that died in this, in this, um, in this Pasuk is, is Hatshepsut. And then Tutmosis III was a Pharaoh of the oppression. And again, I'm doing that based on the dates that we saw from Malachim Aleph. But let's tie it into our sources a little more and, uh, and see, uh, have a little bit of a creative read on this. Okay, so 
We have our pasuk here from Shmot Aleph, Vayakam Melech Hadash, Al Mitzrayim, Asher Lo Yadat Yosef. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Yosef. So uh, there are many interpretations of that. Some people say it's a new king. Some people say it's a, the same king that um, you know pretended not to know about Yosef or what he did. Um, and there is an interpretation that I read that said that this phraseology by Yaakam Mel Hadash refers to a usurper. This new king was a usurper. It wasn't supposed to be someone who ruled. Now that would fit in with Hatshepsut, right? I said, she's a usurper. She wasn't supposed to be the Pharaoh. She made herself Pharaoh. Okay, our next source from, from Shmot Aleph is talking about um, the Pharaoh commanding the midwives, right? So the Pharaoh said, when you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. So this interesting word, Avnayim, there are all these uh, um, interesting, um, uh, I read different articles about people discussing this word, but we're going to use a translation birth stool. So clearly the Pharaoh was very familiar with the birthing process and that would fit in with a female Pharaoh. Hatshepsut, even though Tutmosis III was her stepson, she had her own, at least one child. We know she had at least one daughter. She gave birth herself, used a midwife and would have been very familiar with this. Okay, so that makes sense. The other thing is we know that the midwives were never punished for not following through on the Pharaoh's orders. Orders. Um, and that would also fit in with this because perhaps um, perhaps the administration of Hatshepsut was in such an upheaval because she usurped power. There were many, there were possibly some of her advisors didn't even support her and they didn't want her to be Pharaoh. So perhaps some of her decrees were not being enforced and they were not being followed, including this one to the midwives. So this is a, a, an interesting way to look at the psukim. It fits in, as I said, with the dating of our source from Malachim Aleph. So now some of you might be saying to yourself, wait, we always heard that Ramses, Ramses the second, Ramses the great was a Pharaoh of the Exodus. That is another opinion. And there are many people, including um, Rabbi Josh Berman, uh, Rabbi Landy and others who, who do say that Ramses the second was uh, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So we're gonna present that option as well. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about Ramses the second with uh, a personal picture, actually, another personal picture. This is actually from uh, the mid nineties when I um, was in Israel and I took a trip to Egypt. Um, and so this is me standing next to a sculpture of Ramses II, who's also known as Ramses the Great. This is my friend who I was traveling with lying next to the sculpture of Ramses II. Now I show you this as a very important visualization. We don't have these quite such huge sculptures in the museum, even though we have large ones. But if you go to Egypt, they have these huge, huge sculptures. And again, standing next to them and imagining what it was like, right? Again, imagine being an Israelite slave with these huge sculptures of the pharaohs, of gods and goddesses, and what it must have been like to, to be there. You know, the power of the pharaohs. And again, the the how threatening the Israelites were because of their very different belief system. Um, it really, again, brings all of this to life. So now Ramses II, why do people say that he was a pharaoh? So there are people who date the Exodus to 1290 BCE based on uh, other sources. Um, it doesn't work with our source from Malachim Aleph, but there are other sources that they use to date the Exodus to 1290. Um, and that was when Ramses II was Pharaoh. Now, Ramses II was a fascinating Pharaoh also, uh, very, very strong. He's called Ramses the Great, and uh, for good reason. He ruled for 67 years, uh, which at that time was unheard of. One of the longest ruling monarchs in history, actually. Um, and he lived to be in his 90s, which again, at that time when the average lifespan was, I don't know, maybe 20, 20, a little more than 20 years, King Tut died at 19, right? So uh, living in your 90s was, was uh, a long time, ruling for 67 years, a long time. He had about 200 wives and concubines. He had over 100 children. He conquered a lot of uh, different areas. Um, he was uh, did, had a lot of building uh, uh, projects, and he's known as Ramses the Great. So uh, again, it's thinking of him as the Pharaoh of the Exodus. To think that Moshe took the Israelites out under the uh, rule of this great, all-powerful king is really interesting to think about. And by the way, uh, this is a whole other discussion. When people ask me, is there any archaeological evidence of the Exodus? So there isn't 
actual archaeological archaeological evidence for many reasons from that time period. But one of them, of course, is there's no way that uh, any pharaoh would would want archaeological evidence around about this group of people who were slaves leaving. Certainly not Ramses the Great, who uh, you know everything was about. Um, showing how great he was. And again, the pharaohs only recorded history for propaganda purposes to show how great they were. So that certainly wouldn't be information that they would want recorded. Okay, so now let's see, I'm sure many of you are thinking about the Haggadah and thinking about Ramses and Ramses and what we've always learned, right? So we have our source in, our first source from, um, from Shmot Aleph, Vayesimu alav sarei misim laman anoto besivlotam, vayiven arei miskanot laparo et pitom et Ramses. So, uh, by the way, here's the source I was talking about, one of them that talks about taskmasters, which we saw with the Mecca Ray model. And it's talking about the Israelites be building these cities for Paro, Pitom, and Ramses. So there are people who say, okay, the Israelites built a city called Ramses, so Ramses the Great must have been Pharaoh. So there are a couple of difficulties with that, uh, because first of all, if we looked at our next source from, from Breshit going back in time, when Yosef brought his brothers and his father and settled them in Goshen, Goshen was actually in the region of Ramses. Uh, Ramses and Ramses are uh, very similar. So we had a, we had an area called Ramses way before. I mean, this is more than a hundred years before. Um, before the Israelites were building a city called Ramses. So it's hard to say that Ramses, what Ramses the Great was the Pharaoh because they built a city called um, Ramses. The other thing to keep in mind, by the way, is that Ramses II did rule for a long time, 67 years, he was very powerful, but he wasn't the only uh, Pharaoh named Ramses. There were actually uh, either 11 or 13 different opinions, Pharaohs named Ramses, Ramses I, Ramses II, Ramses III, going on. Um, there was a pharaoh whose name was Ramses, who ruled for 230 years, right? So our, our Ramses the Great ruled for 67 years, but the other 10 Ramses ruled for uh, different amounts of time. And altogether, a Ramses ruled uh, Egypt for 230 years. So it's hard to say that because we have that the Israelites built uh, Ramses, that Ramses the Great was a pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, but we can't, there are people who date it to 1290 BCE. And for any of us who uh, watched um, the Ten Commandments or the Prince of Egypt, I think they also say it was Ramses the Great. Of course, I wouldn't uh, base anything on popular culture or movies, but they did get that from somewhere. And again, that is a, a well-known opinion. Um, and actually, Rabbi Josh Berman has a very interesting discussion about um, that he finds that uh, the Az Yashir and also the, the um, encampment of the Mishkan is actually based on um, Ramses encampment, Ramses II encampment that he did, and also based on a, um, a war poem that was written by Ramses II. Az Yashir is based on a war poem based on uh, Ramses II. So that's a whole book that he wrote. It's uh, a whole art, uh, whole thing, but it's very interesting. So again, there are people who, who say that Tutmosis the third was a pharaoh of the Exodus, and then there are other people who say that Ramses the second was a pharaoh of the Exodus, Ramses the Great, and there are other opinions as well. So food for thought for the Seder, but we here had a way of visualizing both of those, and again, visualizing the, the, the power and how powerful the pharaohs thought that they were. Okay, so before we leave this, just a, just a, another interesting note. Um, when I wanted to go to Egypt, um, a lot of people said to me, you know, you're not allowed to go to Egypt because it says in the Torah, right here we have our source, the Torah warned us in three places not to return to Egypt. Um, and indeed it does say that, but if you look here at our source from uh, the Rambam, Rambam says that it's permissible to return to Egypt to conduct business and commerce, to conquer other lands. The prohibition is only against residing permanently there. Now, of course, we know that there are, um, Jews did live in Egypt. There's the Cairo Geniza, there were shuls. Rambam himself lived in Egypt. So again, there are different opinions about that. Some people say it was a prohibition only in the time of the Torah. Um, some people say it's only if you um, plan to live there forever, but if you don't plan to, then it's not a problem. Lots of different ways to talk about it, but certainly there's there's not an issue with visiting. And in fact, there are many, many rabbis, uh, archaeologists, biblical scholars in Israel who travel to Egypt and do tours there. Um, 
uh, interesting though, the Rambam did write in some of his letters that he did feel uh, badly about living in Egypt because of this, you know, because of these sources. Um, okay, so now we are going to go um, back into the museum um, to look at another room. Again, this is uh, another favorite space of mine in the museum, and we're in the room of uh, paintings. So these are actually not the original paintings. It's the only thing in uh, in the collection that aren't the originals, but there's a good reason for that. Um, and as I'm talking, you can kind of look at these paintings and, and see what you notice about them. These are tomb paintings. So uh, we couldn't uh, take the tomb paintings from Egypt. We couldn't bring the tomb walls to the museum, but instead we did the next best thing and the museum sent artists with the archaeologists. The artists sat in the tombs in the early 1900s through the 1920s. They copied the paintings exactly and brought them back to the museum. So now these paintings are 100 years old. And to me, again, they're amazing. They really bring life in ancient Egypt uh, it's a, a visualization of life in ancient Egypt, the way people dressed. Um, we're going to look at some of these paintings closer up, but the way people dressed, the large class of uh, sleeves, how many sleeves there were, there are paintings with pharaohs in them. Here we have a pharaoh uh, and his wife. We have a lot of paintings of uh, women, and although women were um, not as important as the pharaohs. They were very important. They were actually, um, in ancient culture, women were, uh, among ancient cultures in ancient Egypt, women were probably the, uh, had the best uh, place in society. They could own land. Um, they, were, they were important. Um, we see about agriculture in ancient Egypt. We see more examples of boats. Um, by the way, you also see here two sculptures. These are sculptures of the goddess Sakhmet. Um, you'll notice it's the opposite of the Sphinx, the face of a lion, the body of a female. Sakhmet was the goddess of the plague, of the goddess of plagues. So we know that the plagues did happen in ancient Egypt, not just the 10 plagues, but we do know that plagues happen in ancient Egypt. Uh, plagues of locusts and other lice and other things, so much so that they had, they felt that they had to have a goddess of the plague to help them control, to help them, you know, get rid of these plagues. So just looking at these paintings, um, again, uh, just noticing about ancient Egyptian life. Also for the artistic uh, background, notice that in ancient Egypt, they painted um, people uh, in profile, right? You only see in all the paintings, you only see one eye, the profile of the face. Um, sideways, but sculptures are all fully frontal. So paintings were profile and sculptures were fully frontal. Um, again, just unbelievable all this art that was uh, created in ancient Egypt. So now I just want to show you two of the paintings close up um, that we saw on the wall. This one is so interesting. It's actually an artisan's workshop. This is showing us people, slaves preparing um, objects for, uh, for burial. Okay, uh, you'll see that they're preparing jewelry and they're preparing furniture and all kinds of things that pharaohs and important people will be buried with. Um, the person whose uh, tomb they're preparing, you can see how they indicate importance in these paintings. The biggest person was the most important, right? He's almost twice the size of the other people. Also, somebody did not like this guy because look, they scratched out his face. So again, erasing the face meant you were erasing the memory of that person. Um, just looking at some of the details here. By the way, I said that the artist uh, copy the paintings exactly. So if the paintings, if some parts of it, the paint was, was etched out, so the artist would paint it looking like the paint was scratched out. That's what they did here. Really, really detailed. They weighed gold, made jewelry and furniture. And this is a wonderful uh, close up of someone making a sphinx. And look at the materials they're using to make a sphinx, right? They're using a piece of rock and a nail, a hammer and a chisel. I always say I couldn't make those huge sculptures if I had the most advanced tools in the world, uh, which we do today. Uh, they were making them 4,000 years ago out of a hammer and a chisel. It's, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, just one more painting, again, showing life in ancient Egypt, how they did agriculture in ancient Egypt, what kind of food they ate, how they gathered food, uh, you know, uh, those kind of things, very important. Okay, and, and again, this is me in the museum um, uh, showing uh, a painting with boats. So lots of paintings have boats in them. Again, the importance of the Nile River and boats in ancient Egypt. Okay, we're gonna go to our last, um, our last topic, um, which is the Temple of Dendur. Um, and I'm sure many of you who have been to the museum have been to this room. We're actually gonna go into the room together um, because to me, this room really 
um, brings to life again our sentence that we say at the Seder: "Behold, Rador Chayav Adam Lerot Et Atzmo Ki Ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim." So this room was created for us to feel like we're in ancient Egypt. So if you look in the room, and we'll, we're going to walk around together, you'll notice the Nile River. Uh, you'll notice the windows with the sunlight coming in to feel like the uh, climate of Egypt, the hot desert, the sculptures of pharaohs. You'll see the Temple of Dendor in the background, which we'll which we'll get to. Um, as we're walking down the hallway, you'll see on our left, again, former sculptures of Sakmet, the goddess of the plague, again, showing us that there were plagues in ancient Egypt and they, they, uh, the Egyptians felt they need to appeal to their gods and goddesses to get rid of plagues. Um, again, the sculptures of the, of, of the pharaohs and the gods and goddesses show us uh, how strongly the ancient Egyptians believed in that and how threatening the Israelites were. These are actually pictures on the left wall of showing what the Temple of Dendro looked like in Egypt before it got to the Met. And we will look at those pictures a little closer in a few minutes. Um, I just wanna get us onto the platform with the Temple of Dendro. Here we have the Sphinx of Hatshepsut that we looked at. And here we have the Temple of Dendor. Two, uh, there's a archway and then th this is the temple. It was a temple to the goddess Isis um, built about 2000 years ago, actually during Roman times. Um, but even then they wanted to uh, um, have these uh, Egyptian, important Egyptian artifacts. And on the Temple of Dendor are unbelievable um, hieroglyphics and um, and engravings of the Pharaoh giving offerings to the gods and goddesses. So being in this room, you're supposed to feel like you're in ancient Egypt, all the things that we talked about. And let's just look at a couple of the images um, closer up. So here we have those pictures I had shown you on the wall. So I just wanna tell you the background of the Temple of Dendor. Again, you know, placing us in Egypt and allowing us to feel, you know, what it would have been like. There were a lot of temples built along the Nile River where Egyptians would come and worship. Uh, they wouldn't go inside, they would stand outside and worship. And again, all these temples and all these sculptures and of the pharaohs and pharaohs, pharaohs and um, the uh, female pharaohs and the pharaohs and the gods and goddesses shows uh, the importance of the pharaohs and how important they thought they were. They thought they were representative, the, the human representative of their gods on earth. Um, so this is the Temple of Dendor that was built near the Nile River. This is a picture from the mid 1800s, uh, looking at the Temple of Dendor. Here's another picture from the uh, late 1800s. And I always look at this and, and marvel at the, um, at the architectural elements. Again, it's made out of solid rock. Each stone weighs at least one ton. Some of the stones weigh up to four tons. Okay, so unbelievable. They didn't have machines or cranes or anything like that. But when I point these things out, everyone always asks me, what's the English writing on here? And what's the English carving? And unfortunately, when people visited the Temple of Dendor in Egypt in the early 1800s, and I guess there was no security or anything, people spray painted and carved their names on it. Some of, some of the spray painting we got off and the carvings we couldn't though, unfortunately. Okay, so here we have the Temple of Dendor when it's in Egypt. Now here you see what happened. So in 1960, Egypt built the Aswan Dam. And because of that, the Nile River started to overflow. It started to overflow on these national treasures on these temples along the Nile River. So here that Nile River is only overflowing a little bit. Um, here a little bit more, but here you can see the Temple of Dendor is almost completely submerged in the Nile River. So the Egyptians were getting worried because their national treasures, their, you know, uh, their, um, a lot of their um, architectural elements or temples that were near the Nile River were getting flooded. They appealed to UNESCO and to the United States for help controlling the waters of the Nile River. And the United States sent engineers and help help them deal with this problem. So the Egyptians wanted to thank the United States and they said, we are going to give you one of our temples. We are gonna give you the temple of Dendor as a gift. So of course, every museum in the United States would want an authentic Egyptian temple. So they had a contest and you can read articles about it from the 1960s. It was called the uh, Dendor Derby. Uh, and they had all these contests among different museums, the Smithsonian's, and the Met won the contest. The contest was what would you would do if you were awarded the Temple of Dendor? The Met won because they said they would create an entire wing onto the museum and create a space where you felt like you were in Egypt, which is what we saw before. So the Met won, it was awarded to them, I think in 1965. And starting 1966, 1967, they started to 
uh, do architectural plans, take it apart brick by brick. The bricks were shipped over by boat and then brought to the museum. Um, and the museum built on a wing to house the Temple of Dendor. Again, it's, an, it's really a, an amazing space and certainly an amazing space to visit around Pesach, again, to really imagine and visualize um, everything that, that uh, um, everything that happened through all these um, hieroglyphics, through the pictures of Pharaoh giving offerings to the gods and goddesses. Um, if you visit now, actually, they have, they shine a light on it because the Temple of Dendro would have been painted red and orange, yellow, all, all these colors. Um, we don't have that paint anymore, but the Met is now shining these laser lights on it to make it look even more um, authentic. Um, so we are going to end uh, my part of the program here. And I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for coming. Anyone who wants to ask questions or make comments, um, please stay on. But I really, uh, I want to wish everyone a Chag Kasher Vesamech. And I hope that through this program, you will really be able to fulfill uh, what we talked about of imagining ourselves as if we left Mitzrayim and, uh, you know, really enhancing your Seder in, in another way. <laughs>